Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Michelle, for a great talk. My name is. I may have time for thoughts if you're getting close. I think. Um, I'm Simon Sue. I'm one of the instructors in the Division of Nephrology. And today I hope to offer some clinical perspectives on vitamin D use in kidney disease. And so the goal is talk, I'm trying to keep it simple. And really, I want to answer these five clinically relevant questions when it comes to treating vitamin D um, or using vitamin D in our kidney disease patients. Um, and my goal here is to really provide you um, a snapshot of the highest quality evidence. Um, in answering these questions, which are, what are the theoretical and proven benefits of vitamin D supplementation? What biomarkers are best for evaluating vitamin D status in kidney disease? What biomarker threshold should be targeted? What forms of vitamin D supplementation are best? And wrap up with a discussion of dietary phosphate and phosphate binders. So to begin, what are the theoretical and importantly proven benefits of vitamin D supplementation? So I want to start actually by giving a historical context to how studies of vitamin D and thus our knowledge base really evolved over time. And to do this, I will start by talking about the history of rickets and the discovery of vitamin D. So rickets, of course, is a disease of soft and weakened bones leading to bone pain and fractures. And it was rather rare until the mid 1800s, uh, the Industrial Revolution, where a highly agrarian population became urbanized you have people that had more specialized indoor occupations, smoke from industrial plants that polluted the atmosphere. Um, and under these conditions, rickets appeared in epidemic proportions in low sunlight countries, which included England. And for a while, it was even known as the English disease. In 1919, a gentleman by the name of Sir Edward Mellonby reasoned that rickets may be caused by dietary deficiency uh, and discovered that cod liver oil prevented and cured rickets in dogs. Um, and separately, a pediatrician and a biochemist around the same time independently discovered that rickets in children could be prevented and cured by exposing them to sunlight or to artificially induced UV light. Um, and I always thought how interesting it must have been to live in this time and how strange and curious it must have been this idea that sunlight somehow equaled cod liver oil. But it was really under these circumstances that eventually um, vitamin D was isolated and identified as an essential nutrient in 1931. And so the point I'm trying to make here is that the skeletal benefits of vitamin D in severely deficient individuals have been known for a while. It's really um, how vitamin D was discovered. And so there is broad consensus that vitamin D supplementation should be used to treat and prevent nutritional rickets and osteomalacia in not only infants and children, but really severe vitamin D deficiency at any age. Um, so what about vitamin D use? What's the evidence behind that in CKD and kidney failure? So this is actually a very recently published meta-analysis and review in the journal Bone Mineral uh, Metabolism. Um, and it looked at all six randomized trials comparing activated vitamin D agents to either placebo or no you know, activated vitamin D agents. Um, and the take home point is in that big black diamond here where you can see it crosses the risk ratio of one um, which means that you know, there's no real randomized trial evidence to show that vitamin D prevents fractures in this population. There are a couple of things I'd like to note here. If you actually look at the events column, the number of events in total are very, very small, um, 27. Uh, and in part, that's because most of these studies um, are in a low number of patients um, and also the follow up time was pretty short. So the largest trial is the Shoji trial here of 495 patients, and they actually follow these patients for 48 months. Um, and the Baker study followed patients for five years, but the rest of them actually lasted between 12 weeks and 12 months. Um, so the take home is low number of events uh, and generally low follow up time. I want to move on to talking about the potential extraskeletal effects of vitamin D. So these were not really hypothesized until decades later, and they're based on several arguments, the three strongest ones that are presented here. Um, the first is that vitamin D receptors and the 1-alpha hydroxylase have been found to be widely expressed in many tissues that are not involved in calcium transport. Number two, three to five percent of the human genome um, has been found to be under direct or indirect control by the active vitamin D metabolite, 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. 
Um, and lastly, there are many observational studies that really show associations between non-bone diseases and low 25-hydroxy-D concentrations. Um, and this is just a figure from a recent Nature review um, showing where the vitamin D receptor has been found and where it is hypothesized to have effects you know, um, outside the bone. So things like the immune system, hormone secretion, brain, cancer, skin. Um, so all of these have been hypothesized. And so up until really about a decade ago, there was a tremendous uncertainty about the benefits of vitamin D supplementation in the general population. And so this really led to the funding of several large placebo-controlled randomized trials with clinically important outcomes. Um, and many of these are probably familiar to you all, um, these so-called mega trials of vitamin D. You can notice is the, you know, the ends are all in the thousands. Um, one important thing to note is that most of these patients, um, actually most all of them, uh, are generally vitamin D replete by modern definitions of sufficiency. Um, pretty good follow-up time, you know, anywhere from 2.5 to five years looking at um, an array of primary outcomes. Um, and most of you probably know that all of these studies um, were null randomized trials. So vitamin D supplementation in the general population that are generally vitamin D replete um, had no additional benefit when it came to cancers, cardiovascular disease, CKD progression, um, et cetera, et cetera. So what about vitamin D trials in kidney failure? Uh, so I want to mention that there are many trials in kidney failure that use biochemical outcomes, but what I was interested in and what I've shown here are placebo-controlled trials with at least 50 people with clinical or clinically important surrogate outcomes. Um, and these are all of them, actually, all five. So the J. David trial is a Japanese trial. It's the largest um, and longest, so 976 uh, patients uh, followed over five years. And they're randomized to either alpha calcidol, which is an activated vitamin D agent, or placebo looking at cardiovascular disease. And again, all of these studies were null. The thing that I want to mention with J. David, and I don't know why this was done, is that the study excluded participants with PTH concentrations greater than 180. So effectively, no one with secondary hyperparathyroidism. So I think you have to take these results with a grain of salt um, when it comes to the patient population that we see. The rest of these trials, you'll notice, you know, the ends are much smaller, um, and the follow-up duration is, you know, anywhere from six months to a year. Um, and one shortcoming that I think is they, you know, largely used the inactive form of vitamin D, um, so vitamin D two or D three. Um, but at any rate, they looked at again an array of primary outcomes from strength, functional capacity quality of life, echo changes, um, change in epodose, and all of these show that vitamin D did not have an effect on these outcomes. So the next question I want to attempt to answer, so what biomarkers are best for evaluating vitamin D status in kidney disease? And I think off the top of our heads, these are kind of the three potential candidate markers that come to mind. So a brief review on how they're all related. Um, so of course, when you have reduced calcium, that is primary driver of PTH secretion. And PTH has a positive effect on one alpha hydroxylase that promotes conversion of 25 hydroxy vitamin D into the active form 125. And of course, 125D has an inhibitory effect on PTH secretion. It is part of the reason why we give and titrate um, activated vitamin D agents to, to reduce PTH concentration. So that's the relationship. So I want to start with 125 dihydroxy vitamin D because intuitively, you know, this is the active form. It may seem like the most appealing metabolic measure. But the main reason that we don't is that there's no relationship between concentrations of 125D and vitamin D exposure. In fact, deficient patients may actually have normal or paradoxically increased concentrations of 125D solely because of the compensatory mechanism of PTH, you know, uh, driving one alpha hydroxylase activity in vitamin D deficiency. Um, other reasons we don't use it, it's half-life is extremely short. It's four hours as opposed to days for 25-hydroxy. And it also circulates at 1,000 times lower concentration than 25-hydroxy D. So there's more inter-measurement variability, and the assays that actually measure 125D needs to be more precise. 
And so as such, 125D is really recommended for use only in specific acquired and inherited disorders um, like sarcoidosis or melanomas. Moving on to 25 hydroxy vitamin D, it is the most widely used marker of vitamin D status, at least in the general population, um, mostly because it has a real strong and positive correlation with sun exposure and dietary intake, and also when the two are combined. Um, but the main limitation um, that I ask and other researchers ask is, uh, you know, is it a biomarker of effect? Does it really reflect what's going on in tissue level? Um, and it might not. And one of the arguments um, for this is that concentrations of 25D um, are low concentrations are inconsistently associated with adverse outcomes in all populations. For example, in cardiovascular disease and diabetes, low concentrations, um, the association with those illnesses is uh, attenuated or completely absent in particular non-white um, racial and ethnic groups. And so what does KDGO say when it comes to measuring 25D in kidney disease patients? Um, kind of hand wavy. We suggest that 25 hydroxy D levels might be measured and they kind of just leave it at that. Um, and lastly, PTH. Um, PTH, of course, starts rising fairly early on in CKD. So when EGFR drops above 60, um, and it maintains normal calcium concentrations such that they're pretty much normal until your EGFR is below 20. Um, elevated PTH is associated with morbidity and mortality. I'll talk more about this later. This is the primary reason why guideline recommendations um, have you know, target ranges. And of course, persistently high PTH concentrations, generally above 800 to 1,000, leads to parathyroid hyperplasia and tertiary hyperparathyroidism. And so now that we've kind of established 125 is not a great marker, and the other two may be, um, what thresholds should be targeted? So I will start by talking about 25 hydroxy D, and then I will move on to talking about um, PTH targets. So with regards to 25 hydroxy vitamin D, there's a general agreement that concentrations less than 12 is severely deficient, um, but there's a debate to what is considered normal. And so the National Academy of Medicine and the Endocrine Society um, are the two big societies that you know, argue this. Um, one likes 20 nanograms per mil as a cut point and the other likes 30. They obviously looked at numerous studies to really determine this, um, but this is one of the key ones and one that I find pretty interesting because it's the same study, but they interpreted um, the results pretty differently. So this is a cross-sectional study of 25 hydroxy D concentrations with iliac crest biopsies in 675 European adults. Um, and you look at the key figure on the left. So on the x-axis here, you have 25 hydroxy vitamin D concentrations. On the y-axis is something called osteoid volume over bone volume. And so osteoid is unmineralized bone. So the more osteoid you have, um, the worse condition your bones are. And over 2%, which is the red line here, is a conservative definition for osteomalacia. So the individuals with the dots above this red line are those with osteomalacia and those below um, do not have osteomalacia. And so the authors of this and the endocrine society looked at this paper and said, look, when you draw a green line here at 30 nanograms per mil, everyone you know, at 30 nanograms and higher, um, all of them 100% did not have osteomalacia. And so uh, you know, 30%, uh, 30 nanograms per mil should be the cut point. Um, but the experts at the National Academy of Medicine really said, look, you don't really want to recommend um, a cut point based on, you know, 100% of the population being healthy. You know, nutritionists, when they recommend dietary intake, look at, you know, what is the recommended intake that is sufficient for 97.5% of the population, so, so almost everyone, but not 100%. So if you actually slide this green line over to 20 nanograms per mil, you'll see there's only seven dots, seven participants out of the 675 that have osteomalacia still. So even at a cut point of 20, 99% of participants um, won't have osteomalacia. And so that's why um, the Academy of Medicine and I myself like 20 nanograms per mil as a cut point. Uh, and one thing that I'll mention here is that if you actually slide the green bar down further to 10 nanograms or lower, you'll see that even 50% of participants with this low 25 hydroxy D have adequate bone mineralization, suggesting you know there might be better markers of bone health um, and vitamin D status. Um, 
This is a study that I did, and I actually presented this at Brand Rounds last year, so I won't belabor it, but again, supporting kind of this cut point of 20 nanograms per mil. Real briefly, this was a clinical trial of 499 participants um, designed to really identify characteristics that modify the response to vitamin D over 16 weeks. And among the characteristics that um, we tested was baseline 25D concentration. And the primary outcome we looked at was change in PTH because it was kind of a tissue level response marker of how much vitamin D is binding um, at the tissue level. And so using this cut point analysis, we found, you know, um, participants, you know, on a population level with a 25, um, with a baseline 25D of 21 nanograms or, low, or lower had a greater response um, in PTH and change in PTH than those above this threshold. Um, where on average, there tended to be very minimal change in PTH. Um, again, suggesting that 20 nanograms per mil may be the optimal um, definition of vitamin D sufficiency. And so that's 25D. So moving on to the evidence for PTH goals. Um, what does KDGO say? So in non-dialysis CKD, the optimal PTH level is not known. Um, and that is true, it's, it's really not known. Um, and in kidney failure on dialysis, they say, you know, we all know this, we suggest maintaining PTH concentrations in the range of approximately two to nine times the upper normal limit. Um, and so why this wide range? Um, so these are studies that I selected um, that looked at mortality and kidney failure. These are all observational studies in reputable journals. Um, you, what you'll notice, you know, very, very large ends, pretty decent follow-up. And you'll see that the PTH inflection point for mortality is pretty variable here. Um, so 400, 480, 500, 511, 600. And because this is kind of the best data that we have, and you can't pinpoint um, a PTH inflection point for mortality on the account of differences in the assay um, and confounding, you know, that's why KD goes as, you know, the best we can say is between two and nine. And so one of the main take home points that I want to give you is there are no randomized clinical trials that really show treatment to any PTH level results in improved outcomes or that establish a cause and effect relationship between PTH concentrations and observed outcomes. The next question, uh, what forms of vitamin D supplementation are best? So this is really, you know, in what population should we use inactive vitamin D agents and in what population should we use, you know, activated agents? And are there differences between these agents? Um, and I largely agree with KDG on this one. So they suggest in non-dialysis KD that calcitriol and activated vitamin D analogs not be routinely used. Um, and the evidence for this is that there are higher incidences of hypercalcemia in non-dialysis CKD and kidney failure. Um, and so I agree with that. And of course, in kidney failure, they don't have a lot of 1-alpha hydroxylase. So um, we suggest calcium emetics, calcitriol, or activated vitamin D analogs, or a combination of these medications to treat um, you know, secondary hypothyroidism in kidney failure. All right, so the next question, as I mentioned, is you know, we have so many different activated agents that we can use in kidney failure on hemodialysis? Um, are there head-to-head -head trials comparing the two and what are the results? Um, so there are, and I'm actually gonna show you all three of them. Uh, so first up, IV calcitriol versus IV paracalcitol. Um, this is a study done in 2003, an N of 266 followed over eight months. And cutting to the chase, more in the paracalcitol group achieved target PTH, which they define as at least a 50% reduction in PTH from baseline, um, which I personally think is pretty aggressive. Um, there was actually no difference in the number of participants with at least one episode of hypercalcemia, though the paracalcitol group had less sustained hypercalcemia, which they defined as at least two or more consecutive measures of hypercalcemia. So it would seem, you know, based on this trial, that IV, IV paracalcitol wins this matchup. Um, there was a rematch, actually, 10 years later. Uh, oral formulations of these medications it was a smaller study, 66 participants, follow-up over six months. Um, and this study actually found there's no difference in the achieved PTH, uh, a more liberal um, definition, 30% reduction from baseline, uh, and no difference in the mean calcium through predefined 
points throughout the entire study or incidence of hypercalcemia between the two groups. What I find interesting about this study is that um, the dosages of calcitriol and paracalcitol are not equivalent, so you have to do some kind of conversion. And this study compared with the previous study actually used a higher equivalent dose of calcitriol. And so you would think, so, you know, these patients washed out of vitamin D and then when they started it, you know, you were titrating equivalently. And so this study actually used, again, a higher equivalent dose of calcitriol and yet did not find um, any difference in calcium or hypercalcemia. And so in my mind, I think the jury is still out when comparing these two agents. And just to be complete, this is actually just the last head-to-head -head matchup um, out there, IV calcitriol versus IV max calcitol, um, and no difference in the mean or achieved PTH and calcium throughout the entire study between the two groups. Um, so the question you may have is, are there trials comparing IV paracalcitol um, to oral agents? Um, to my knowledge, there are no quality randomized trials, but I really like this observational study. Um, this was done in Fresenius uh, Kidney Care Clinics. It's a retrospective cohort study where they basically matched 2280 patients who went from IV paracalcitol to oral calcitriol um, to 2280 patients who remained on IV paracalcitol. Um, and they were matched on uh, a you know, myriad of characteristics. And they looked at biochemical outcomes, so serum calcium, phosphate, and PTH, and also hospitalization and survival over 12 months. Um, and what this study actually found is that the oral calcitriol group had lower incidence of hypercalcemia and lower mean serum calcium and phosphate at every three-month interval compared to the participants that stayed on IV paracalcitol without a difference in hospitalization and survival, suggesting that maybe you can achieve the same outcomes but actually have um, you know, reduced hypercalcemic events when you use oral calcitriol. Um, so lastly, uh, something I want to touch on is something you may see referred as combination therapy. And um, what, you know, people mean by this is a combo of inactive vitamin D, like alcoholicalciferol, plus an activated vitamin D agent. So what's the evidence for this? So proponents would say, you know, there are actually 1-alpha hydroxylase that is present extrarenally um, in many tissues like breast, colon, prostate, lung, um, a lot of tissues where the vitamin D receptor is found. And in vitro studies suggest that these cells can take up 25-hydroxy-D and using their own 1-alpha hydroxylase convert it into 125-D intracellularly at higher than serum concentrations. And so uh, these uh, experts argue that the current dosages of activated vitamin D that we give in patients on dialysis may be inadequate to regulate things like cell proliferation, cytokine production, and other biological processes. Um, so that's kind of the theory behind combination therapy. And so the best available data that we have, um, observational non-randomized trials of combo therapy show perhaps not surprisingly, that 25D and 125 concentrations are improved, um, and you're able to reduce the dose of activated vitamin D use in kidney failure. But again, you'll notice a recurrent theme here. There are no randomized trials that have really evaluated this, this strategy on clinically important outcomes. So um, in my estimation, the jury's still out, and I personally don't really check or use um, you know, 25D or coli in my kidney failure patients, um, unless there's un unique circumstances. Um, so wrapping it up with the role of dietary phosphate and phosphate binders, um, going back to our diagram here. So this was actually on my board. So fellows take note. Um, so how phosphate fits into this picture. So elevated phosphate will inhibit one alpha hydroxylase through the effect of FGF23. And so when you inhibit 1-alpha hydroxide, of course, you have reduced calcitriol. And so calcium like, drops and so your PTH um, secretion goes up. And so, of course, um, besides reducing phosphate, a role of phosphate binders is that, um, or effect, I should say, is that it also reduces your PTH concentration. Um, so do phosphate binders work? Yes, for lowering phosphate concentrations, but do they confer clinically meaning benefits? Well, let's see what the studies say. Um, so I'll talk about non-dialysis EKD, and then I'll wrap it up with kidney failure on dialysis. Uh, 
So this was a paper in JAMA. It was a meta-analysis of three studies, one of which Brian Kastenbaum wrote. Um, and it showed in the non dialysis CKD population, 35% higher risk mortality per one milligram per deciliter increase in serum phosphate. So pretty crazy stuff. And a uh, young and bright investigator by the name of Raj Marosha, still young, still bright, um, wanted to see if this association um, was modified by access to care. So at the time, and it still might be the largest um, cohort study in CKD, over 10,000 patients, um, he looked at the association of phosphate and mortality. And to his surprise, the results were robustly null um, you know, in unadjusted and adjusted analysis. So he did not find an association between serum phosphate and all-cause mortality, making his primary reason for doing the study actually pretty moot, which is pretty interesting. Um, and so at least in the non-dialysis CKD population, observational studies of phosphate mortality show mixed results. Um, and there are no observational studies or randomized trials to my mind to suggest phosphate binders in this population affect clinical outcomes. So what about in kidney failure? So observational studies in kidney failure more consistently show high phosphate associated mortality. And there are actually two observational studies that show phosphate binder use is associated with lower mortality. Um, one of them is here, it's a JASM paper, 10,000 incident HD patients followed up over one year. Um, you can see the hazard ratio comparing phosphate binder use with untreated is much lower in the phosphate binder group. Um, and again, there's another study kind of replicating this in 20 European countries that also show benefits um, with respect to phosphate binder use. Um, and again, this is something you've heard from me before, no randomized clinical trials to really suggest that phosphate binders affect clinical outcomes in kidney failure. It's all observational. Um, and so that's where the HILO trial comes in. It is a trial that's actively recruiting. It's a randomized trial of phosphate management for patients on dialysis. In short, you have patients randomized to a liberal or high phosphate target of greater than 6.5 compared with low, um, which is a uh, more aggressive management to 5.5, and they're looking at the primary outcome of all-cause hospitalization, um, the secondary outcome of mortality. So this is ongoing, and I think we'll really fill a gap, a uh, much-needed gap in our clinical care of our patients on dialysis. All right, take-home points. So vitamin E supplementation prevents and cures nutritional rickets in infants, children, and severely vitamin D deficient adults. And that's defined as a 25-hydroxy D of less than 12 nanograms per mil. A 25D concentration of over 20 is adequate for bone health of over 97.5% of the population. Supplementation in vitamin D replete individuals does not provide additional health benefits. Existing vitamin D trials in kidney failure have failed to demonstrate health benefits, although larger and longer trials that use activated vitamin D are needed. There's no definitive evidence to offer one formulation of activated vitamin D over another in kidney failure. And the evidence base for lowering PTH and phosphate remains limited due to a lack of interventional trials and their optimal concentrations are not known. Um, these are all the awesome people I have to thank. Uh, and with that, I will take questions. Thanks so much, Simon. Uh, questions for Simon? I have a question, uh, Matt. Yes, please, Steve. Yes. It's it's uh, it's been almost twenty years since Kadokli did did have specific recommendations for PTH, and you may remember that some of the numbers were stage four seventy to one ten and stage five one hundred fifty to three hundred. That's all changed with the recent guidelines. But my question is, did you get a sense of when people would still treat a high PTH? Because you'll see different expert opinions without good evidence that, for example, if it goes up to the 200s and keeps rising, that you might still give calcitriol or, or an analog. Did you have a sense of what people are doing even without good evidence for treating high PTH? <laughs> That's a great question. I think um, what people are doing, for lack of a better term, uh, is all over the place. And But if you're asking me what you are, um, I think, you know, certainly the evidence is lacking, but when you get above 800 to 1,000, there's pretty good evidence of, you know, autonomous PTA secretion. That's something we want to avoid. 
So I'd say, you know, at least, you know, 800 is a scary number for me. So what number am I less scared at? You know, I think 600 or lower, um, especially if someone is stable between, you know, 400 to 600 on a vitamin D dose, I think that's completely acceptable. Um, with regards to rising PTH, I think it depends on the rate of rise, but if they were to go suddenly again from 200 to 600, I don't think anyone would fall to you despite a lack of evidence um, for raising their vitamin D uh, or starting active, activated vitamin D. Um, there's a quote from the HBO show, The Wire, that I really like, which is, uh, we are doing the best that we can with the information that we have, um, and that's something that I buy by. All right, thank you very much. All right, uh, well, there's one comment just from Suzanne uh, about sort of commenting on the difficulties of clinical trials in this area with respect to the HILO trial. Um, and uh, I agree with her, I'm glad you're working in this area, uh, Simon. So with that, I think we'll, we'll move on to our third speaker. 